Hey there crew and welcome to Sedona, Arizona. I'm here at Cathedral Rocks on a hike with the family. Um, geology professor Sean Wilsey, thanks for joining me. I thought we'd put together a little video as we go up the trail here, up to the saddle at Cathedral Rocks and look at closely uh, a layer here that is not found at the Grand Canyon. Uh, so it's kind of a missing layer that does not exist at the Grand Canyon. It's actually in between though two different rock layers that are found at the Grand Canyon. It's called the Schneebly Hill Formation. So we, it's most um, beautifully exposed here in the Sedona area, but you also find it in other parts of Arizona as well. Here we have a simple set of stratigraphic columns that I put together for both regions, both Sedona and the Grand Canyon area. Notice that the top three units, the Kaibab, Torweep, and Coconino formations are all present in both locations. But then we get down here to the Schneebly Hill Formation, which is found in Sedona, sitting on top of the Hermit Formation, but is not found in the Grand Canyon region. And what this might suggest is that the marine coastal dunes that existed at the time the, Sedona, the Schneebly Hill Formation uh, was formed about 280 million years ago, those weren't found at the Grand Canyon. Maybe the Grand Canyon was slightly elevated, or for whatever reason, those sets of rocks were not deposited there. But that's why this unit is so interesting, is it gives us some insights into conditions in the region uh, that we don't find in the Grand Canyon area. Let me just go ahead and show you just the, the quick little landscape here. So we came from down here where the trees are, and that's down in the Hermit Formation of red, a kind of a brick red uh, mudstone, siltstone mainly. Then you can see as we break out of the trees here and look up into the cliffs here, this is looking at more or less most of the thickness of the Schneebly Hill Formation. This is a unit that was deposited about 280 million years ago during the Permian, for, uh, Permian period of the Mesozoic, uh, excuse me, of the Paleozoic era. Um, and you can see it consists of some ledgy units, more cliff units, different colors. So we're gonna take our little hike up here and show you some parts of the Schneebly Hill Formation and then also explain a little bit about how this was deposited. Well, let's take a second here and talk about why the rocks in the Sedona area are red, why there's so much red rock uh, that defines this region. So most of the rocks here, a lot of sandstones, some mudstones, and remember that most of these rocks, in terms of composition, they're made out of quartz, and quartz is a very light-colored um, mineral. It's usually colorless or sometimes white, but when the other rocks that were being, other minerals being deposited had iron in them, things like biotite, hornblende, rocks that were shed off the continent. And as those rocks broke down chemically, they would shed off, um, or the iron would be leached out of those rocks. And then that iron would form a coating around the quartz grains. And so each quartz grain is coated in a thin veneer of this kind of red to pinkish iron material. But in places, what we see here um, are zones where there's this little bit of a white layer. So if we look down here, you can see there's a little white layer in the sandstone. And the explanation that's been offered for these more white layers are these are slightly uh, larger grain sizes of the sand. So the sand is actually more porous, or excuse me, more permeable. The space between the grains is larger. And so as the groundwater moves down, as that rock was deposited, it's actually able to strip away groundwater strips away that iron coating around those sand grains and leaves behind uh, the white layer we see here. So that explains a little bit about some of the colors you see here in the sandstones of the Schneebly Hill Formation. Um, so we'll continue our little journey up towards the saddle there and see what awaits us. Here you can see how tricky it is to work up the trail. It's just this slick rock slope where you've just got to step up and use your footing to ascend these kind of steep rock slabs where friction is your friend. So we're almost near the saddle now and a different part of the formation shows up right here. Can you see this gray maybe two meter thick, maybe three, about 10 feet or so, thick kind of blocky layer. A little bit different color, 
although probably a little hard to tell looking that way towards the sun, kind of a grayish layer that comes around over here. Uh, and then right in front of us here is the nice contact and it's a little bit erosional. So it's still part of the Schnebly Hill formation, but you can see a little bit of undulations here on the bottom part of this contact. And what this rock is up here, this gray rock, is a limestone. So we have all these sandstones and mudstones here in the Schnebly Hill Formation. Well, here's a little bit of limestone. And as most of you probably know, limestone is usually deposited by the sea. So here is a record of a very quick and brief incursion of the sea into this otherwise kind of coastal dune and tidal flat area that deposited this limestone here. And then the upper contact over here is fairly sharp as well. So it's almost as if, you know, the sea came in for a short time, maybe, you know, short time geologically, maybe several thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years possibly, uh, deposited this three meter, 10 foot section of limestone and then withdrew from the area. This is a part of the Schnebly Hill Formation known as the Fort Apache Limestone um, or the Fort Apache Member. So great view of the contact right here. Let's just go ahead and go up this slope if we can. Now we're right in the limestone and then here's the sharp contact with the upper part of the limestone and going right in, back into the sandstone here. Actually, this is still more the limestone. I think it's this next contact up that looks at this. So this part here is the sandstone right here. And then sandstone all the way up as far as we look. So nice contact here with the limestone and the sandstone. All right, so here's the upper part of the Fort Apache limestone and the sharp contact here. And then from here all the way up to the top of uh, the tower is all sandstone back to more uh, windblown dune deposits. So let's go ahead and follow the contact over here to the saddle and then see what we can find over here. I'll get past the prickly pear more people up here. It's one of the more popular hikes in Sedona. So lots of folks hiking up here. And then let's see the view from off this side over here. And then here's the, the special treat that I knew was up here, but it's my first hike up here to see this. So you can see Girls over here hiking across the ledge formed by the Fort Apache limestone. But then we have this black layer down here that's different. And I think we'll be able to scramble over there and take a look at that because that's something very different. So part of the story here is it's, you know, a lot of sedimentary rocks in this part of Arizona. But again, we're in a part of Arizona where it's transitioning from the Colorado Plateau, where we have stacks of sedimentary rocks, into the basin and range, where we have volcan young volcanic rocks, uh, old metamorphic rocks that have been uplifted along faults, areas of active extension. And so what this dark rock down here is looking like, to me, is a dike, a basaltic dike that's cutting through these red sandstones. So we're gonna head down this steep little path here and see if we can get a good look at it up close. And then I'm wondering if it actually projects up into the rocks behind me here. So let's see what we can see if we come down this way. Just about there. So there is record of some volcanic activity here in this region from about, oh gosh, 15 to maybe 5 million years ago, there were several phases of volcanism in this part of Arizona. So it's very likely related to that. But yeah, sure enough, here's this very dark rock. You can see the, uh, see some of the little bubbles in here, the gas bubbles, vesicles. 
in this basalt as it cuts right through. Oh, here's a nice exposure here. Um, you can see some of the olivine crystals in here as well. Classic, beautiful. Yeah, so nice bit of volcanic rock imprinted on this landscape with all these sedimentary rocks here. And it obviously harder than the sandstone, so it sticks up in relief. Let's scramble up this way and see if we can see it come through the, the saddle behind us here. I'm not sure if it does or not. It may actually form this saddle that I see right here. Yeah, I can't quite see it up there, um, but a lot of trees, so I'll have to maybe check that out, but just give you a nice little view here of this just beautiful setting up here at Cathedral Rocks. And then as we come down, we've got this plug of dark volcanic rock forming this dike that just sticks up here. And then looking over here at the upper part of the Schneebly Hill Formation with the Fort Apache member, the limestone layer. And over here towards the saddle. Beautiful. Quick little addendum here. Got on top of the, uh, the basaltic dike here just for a quick look around in a photo. And there's pieces of the sandstone embedded in the basalt. So we have here a xenolith, an actual chunk of the sandstone that was incorporated in the magma as it rose towards the surface. Uh, didn't get completely melted, probably because this stuff was cooling quite quickly, um, but is still preserved within the rock there. So a pretty sweet little xenolith there embedded in the basalt. Very nice. A little closer view at it there. Nice. So here's where the dike uh, sticks out of the rock where I just was. Um, over on the west side, but I scrambled up into the saddle to see if it was actually exposed where it cuts through uh, the sandstone itself and it is it ever it is exquisitely exposed right here uh, the dark rock that just runs right up through the sandstone. I mean, that's that's as good as it gets when it comes to geologic contacts. It's a lot thinner here. It's only maybe a meter or less wide and it actually looks like it's thinning a little bit as you work your way up. So the thickness changes a little bit as you work your way up. Hard to see any sort of contact changes along the margin because it's kind of just sandy from people scrambling up here. But what a really nice exposure of the, the dike coming through here. And then it looks like it might just pinch out completely. Let's see if we can chase it a little bit farther. Yeah, I think it's just about gone here, right about this point. Yep, a little bit of it left there. Um, might go a little bit farther. Yeah, there's still a little bit of it in here. And it does come up to the top. Here's, I guess it does continue. Here's some of the uh, contact zone kind of brecciated a little bit along here. But you can see this sharp contact with the sandstone where the dike cuts through there. I think I'll end it right here. Since if we go up higher, there's a bunch of folks. Let's try it anyway. Well, thanks for joining me on this little excursion, friends, up Cathedral Rocks. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we saw quite a bit of diversity with uh, the sandstone and the Schneebly Hill Formation, a unit that does not exist in the Grand Canyon, even though the rocks above it, the Coquinino Sandstone, are in the Grand Canyon. The rocks below it, the Hermit Formation, is also in the Grand Canyon, but this is sort of a, a missing layer from the Grand Canyon region that's preserved here around Sedona. Also, some cool record of volcanic activity with this dike sitting here behind me. 
Hope you enjoyed this little episode of the Geology Around Sedona, and we'll see you next time. Take care.